Breaking news this hour on RT International. President Putin's spokesperson has stressed that the Russian and Ukrainian presidents have not agreed on a ceasefire, as Russia is not a part of the conflict. Now, it comes after Kiev announced a permanent ceasefire in the east of Ukraine. It's believed the two leaders discussed the issue uh, over the phone. The self-proclaimed republics in the east say they're ready to sit down and open dialogue if Kiev does stop its uh, military assault, its so-called anti-terror operation. Ukraine's military crackdown on anti-government fighters has been continuing for five months, but Ukraine, Kiev, has now announced a permanent ceasefire. And here is a tweet from the Ukrainian president confirming the news. Petro Poroshenko says, as a result of my phone conversation with the Russian president, we reached an agreement on a permanent ceasefire. Well, the violence in the east of the country has taken a heavy toll on the people there. According to a report from the UN Refugee Agency, since the start of the conflict, more than 700,000 Ukrainians have fled the fighting to Russia. And on top of that, there are more than 100,000 displaced inside the country itself. Many of their homes were destroyed by the army's indiscriminate artillery fire on the towns and the cities in the east of Ukraine. Well, we're now joined live by Ben Aris, a Moscow-based editor and publisher of Business News Europe magazine. Um, thank you very much for joining us live, developing story, breaking news. Uh, the Ukrainian army has suffered uh, serious losses recently. How big a factor do you think that could be in the decision and the timing of this announcement? I think it has everything to do with the decision in so much as uh, after taking over as President Poroshenko um, lets a, a ceasefire, the previous one, lapse, and in effect uh, launched a military assault to retake uh, control of uh, the whole country, particularly in the east. And uh, as we went into the Minsk summit that happened last uh, week, which has effectively opened the formal beginning of a peace process, um, there was a big push by the Ukrainian army. Uh, in order to, to end the conflict, in order to take control of the territory. However, that, that push failed um, as the, the, the pro-Russia um, separatists uh, pushed back. And I think it became very clear within a matter of days um, that there was no way the army, the Ukrainian army, was going, going to have a battlefield victory. Um, you have to understand that the, the clock is ticking on Ukraine and this military conflict cannot last forever. The country is uh, virtually bankrupt, um, is living hand to mouth on IMF bailouts and indeed they just asked for the, asked for the last bailout to be, the two uh, next bailouts to be concertinaed together because they're desperate for money and Poroshenko desperately needs to bring this conflict to an end because he has the whole work of 20 years of economic reforms ahead of him before he can put the country back on its feet. There has been a previous ceasefire which was uh, breached by, by both sides. Um, Poroshenko has described this one as a permanent ceasefire. Um, what do you think the chances are that this one will last? Well, uh, you know, it's actually um, down to, to the, the, the rebels in, uh, in the east to, to go along with this. And the early reports come out shortly after Poroshenko's statement said that they, uh, they would agree to a ceasefire um, if... The, the government calls the Ukraine army off and, and abides by a ceasefire. So now we have everything on the table we need to begin the process. Um, however, there's fighters in the field and uh, on both sides they're very fragmented. You know, on the, on the Russian side, uh, also on the, the pro-Russia side, there's various groups fighting uh, Ukrainians and reports of Russian regular troops. On the Ukrainian side, there's the Ukrainian army, but then there's also these so-called volunteer battalions, um, which represent various radical groups. And whether they can be persuaded to, to sign up to the ceasefire remains to be seen. Mm. So the whole thing remains fragile. However, this is really good news. And uh, as I said before, the country itself definitely and desperately needs the fighting to end because uh, the rest of the economy is, in, is bankrupt. And Donetsk in the Donbass region remains the most productive part of the country. And Ukraine doesn't work without it. So you're, you're saying that Kiev wants and needs this cease ceasefire to last. Uh, does it have the control over those factions in the East, those extremist factions, to be able to ensure that this does last this time? Well, that remains to be seen, uh, and it's really not clear. Uh, as I said, there, there's too many sort of semi-autonomous uh, groups fighting in Ukraine. It's not a simple us-versus-them scenario. 
And the, the trick is going to be to get you know the allies of the, of the pro-Kiev um, rebels to, to sign up uh, to this ceasefire. However, if Kiev withdraws the Ukrainian army, then the remaining groups will be seriously outnumbered. And I don't think it's practical for them to continue fighting without the support of the government. So the way is there to, call, um, to bring about the ceasefire, but it remains fragile. Western governments have been ramping up the rhetoric against Russia in recent, uh, recent months and weeks with talk of escalating sanctions, for example. How do you think this announcement will change that narrative, especially with the NATO summit beginning in the next 24 hours? Indeed, uh, it's actually been getting quite scary. I mean, people have been calling for uh, NATO um, either to attack, and the more sensible people have been saying at least for the West to, to, to arm the Ukrainian army, which would lead to you know, a serious fight that, uh, that would, you know, could suck in everybody else. Um, beginning of at least a Yugoslavian, or if not uh, a wider war between the West and Russia. No one wants to go there. However, I think that the West will have a muted reaction to this because at the end of the day, it's only a ceasefire that in theory leaves all the two sides, the forces in place. And it doesn't say anything about withdrawing the alleged Russian support for the, uh, the pro uh, Russian fighters in the East. And no one's going to be happy with the situation until all of those, those military combatants are removed from the region. And nothing's been said about that. This is really just the first step in a longer process of bringing about a workable peace that satisfies everybody's demands. And of course, we know that Russia has some very serious and difficult demands that it's making on Ukraine. And given that Poroshenko has an election, a parliamentary election to fight in October, he's going to be very reluctant to concede much to the, to the Russian demands. So it's going to be a very difficult few months before we get to some sort of end to this story. Mm. From your understanding and from your, what you, you've, you've been reading, uh, do you get the feeling that this is going to lead to genuine and sincere dialogue, this ceasefire? Uh, yes, it's a prerequisite. I mean, we, we said going into the Minsk, Minsk summit that the beginning of this long and complicated negotiation, which is in effect rebuilding European relations in the center of Europe uh, in a post-Soviet uh, context, which hasn't been done, it hasn't been addressed, none of these questions have, that the prerequisite is uh, a ceasefire. And now we've got that. And so from that, the, 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 the rebels are meeting with the contact group in Minsk on Friday to take up the next uh, stage in the negotiations, which is how are the relations between the various regions in Ukraine going to be organized with Russia? How is Russia going to organize its relations like trade and gas um, with Kiev? And how does that fit into the EU's demands and its desire to see um, Ukraine move in its direction? So there's a lot of very complicated questions and really this is kind of overdue in so much as post collapse of the Soviet Union no one's really thought about how to structure um, pan-European relationships and so we're going to go through that process now and it's a long difficult question. Uh, ben Aris thank you very much for your time here on RT International that's Ben Aris editor Pleasure. of Business New Europe uh, reacting to the developing news here on RT International and that news is that uh, President Putin's spokesperson has stressed that the Russian and Ukrainian presidents have not agreed on a ceasefire as Russia is not part of a conflict. It follows the news that earlier Kiev announced, President Poroshenko announced a permanent ceasefire in eastern Ukraine. It's believed the two leaders discussed the issue uh, over the phone. Self-proclaimed republics in, in the east say that they are ready to open dialogue if Kiev stops its military assault Ukraine's military crackdown uh, on anti-government fighters has been ongoing for five months. And here is a tweet from the Ukrainian president confirming that truce in the east of Ukraine. Petro Poroshenko says, as a result of his phone conversation with the Russian president, that uh, he has reached an agreement with Putin, uh, so says Poroshenko, on a permanent ceasefire.